The Unshackled Waves, episode 33. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, here for this week's review episode. I'm joined this week by one of the Unshackled's regular contributors, uh, Arthur Pigeons. Welcome back. Thanks very much, Tim. Now, Australian federal politics in the past week has seen industrial relations return to the forefront of the national debate with the Fair Work Commission decision last week to reduce uh, Sunday and public holiday penalty rates for several industrial awards. We also saw that the federal government had another shocking news poll this week. So, of course, leadership speculation has begun again. Uh, Tony Abbott late, late last week put put out his five-point plan for winning the next election, and early this week it was revealed that he was part of a group of MPs called the Deplorables, who are trying to get Tony Abbott back into Cabinet. Meanwhile, Donald Trump's continued his war with the mainstream media and announced he would not be appearing at the annual White House Correspondents' Association dinner this year, and refused to invite several media outlets to a private White House press pre- briefing last week. Later this week, he addressed a joint sitting of Congress, reaffirming his presidential agenda, and it was a speech which was pleasing to see that it was praised by everyone. So finally, he got some positive coverage from the mainstream press. Now, for those who watch this podcast on YouTube, you will notice that there is not a video version for this episode. There's just the Unshackled logo. That's because uh, Arthur has had uh, some problems with Skype, so he's had to phone in to Skype to do this uh, sh- show for, for today. So uh, te- uh, technology does, isn't always on our side, but uh, we're doing the best we can. Yes, apologies for that technical hitch, Tim. Yep, but for well, the show, the show goes on, so uh, your voice may be a bit squeaking, but it'll all be uh, a rock solid political analysis. Well, I hope so. So let's begin with the first topic for this week, which is the Fair Work Penalty Rates decision, which came uh, was uh, put down last uh, Thursday. Uh, now, what? We'll go through the details of it first. So, uh, f- four industries are affected. There's the the fast food industry, there's the hospitality industry, and then there's the uh, retail industry and also the pharmacy uh, industry. It doesn't, it doesn't abolish Sunday and uh, public holiday penalty rates. It only reduces them for, by, uh, by around 20, uh, 25%. And it should also be pointed out that these are uh, what's termed industrial award wages uh, they are different from uh, enterprise bargaining agreements, which is the agreements that uh, unions negotiate with uh, with the big corporations, such as the, the major supermarket chains and uh, fast food outlets. So a lot of people are governed by enterprise bargaining agreements. They have actually had their penalty rates negotiated away by the the, the trade union movement. So it's quite it's quite hypocritical of the unions to say we don't want the awards award penalty rates to be reduced, yet they have been negotiated away in an enterprise uh, bargaining agreement. The people who are covered by uh, the, uh, the workers who are covered by these awards are working in small businesses. So small business people, uh, obviously, they, they, they're having to pay higher penalty rates than those that are working for the big corporations. So it'll really help out small businesses helping to compete with, with the larger corporations, which is good. And it'll also lead to obtaining more work hours and employment for, for people in those small businesses. So it really is a, a good decision. But of course, we've just been hearing how awful it is the past week. That doesn't surprise me at all. Um, I suppose this is one of the things you get when you put yourself in the position of the government deciding what the wage rates are going to be and fiddling around uh, with that and placing these onerous burdens on small business people in the first place. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. It's obvious to people like us that uh, reducing uh, Sunday penalty rates. It will mean that uh, 
a lot of businesses will now be able to open on a Sunday. Uh, they'll hire more people. There'll be uh, a lot more people who are already employed getting getting extra shifts, which is good. That's more money for them. And also uh, more people will be employed because businesses will be open longer and therefore they'll, they'll need more staff. So it, it's... It's good for the economy, definitely, but uh, convincing people of the of the benefits of it is really difficult. I mean, and, but it's also the fact that the trade union movement are just so effective in influencing the public debate. Well, I really wonder whether they are that effective. I'm sure they're very effective at influencing uh, the mainstream media debate, but um, increasingly I'm wondering what is the relevance of um, the mainstream media and you know you say that the public are um, influenced by what the trade unions say but a lot of the public are actually small business people themselves and I would urge any small business people who um, have an issue with penalty rates or who make decisions not to open on a particular day of the week or um, don't make money on that day of the week to give consideration to spreading the message around their friends and family uh, to show them how it works. I, I do I do think that the the reason why I think the the unions are 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 effective is because I wrote an article uh, on, on this decision when it when it happened last week and even though like when I talk about social and cultural issues they they're quite re well received by uh, our audience people were really uh, uh, divided on on my article and there's still this re uh, this attitude that oh this decision it benefits a uh, big business and it's just going to screw over the little guy and you know more money for the fat cats uh, there really still is this perception uh, that the trade union movement are the only people in Australia preventing uh, you know, basically third world exploitation in Australia. I mean, despite that we had the the Abbott government had the Royal Commission into Trade Union Corruption, even though all that corruption was exposed in the trade union movement, Australians still view the trade union movement as this benevolent, well-meaning institution protecting them from these evil business people. I mean, that that's that, that that's the perception that I get. And even though, uh, you know, uh, we talk we talk about all the benefits that uh, stem from labor market deregulation it's it's so hard to to break down this uh, perception right well that um that interests me i think that might be a cultural difference there because uh in new zealand um the labor party is heavily influenced by trade unions but they are the only party and it's really seen by outsiders of the labor party as being quite archaic and um, of course, you know, if there's an industrial dispute, um, then we hear from the labour unions. Otherwise, um, few people really want to know what they have to say. And I do notice when I go to Australia, there's a lot more talk of um, trade unions. I had assumed that people had a, a bit of a similar attitude in Australia, um, but perhaps uh, they've drunk a bit more of the Kool-Aid over there well, also another factor I think is is that the business lobby are just so poor at uh, selling their message and also also entering the public debate. I mean, I'll gi I'll give you an example of what it's like in uh, Australia. Uh, people hand out how to vote cards on election day. Like I did that uh, last federal election. There was probably about five different union people handing out how to vote cards. Uh, people handing out on behalf of the business community was zero. There was basically the, the Liberal Party and, th and that was basically it for the, the right side of politics. I mean, the, the business lobby, they, 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 they don't put it, like they might do an ad campaign every now and then, but they just so tame, they, they don't really want to, want to get their hands dirty or put some serious uh, resources into influencing the public debate. I mean, uh, I, I know that a lot of conservative uh, and libertarian uh, people are just so frustrated with this timid approach of the business community and sort of like, it's no wonder you're not getting anywhere with, with this sort of uh, t timid uh, campaigning. Yes, um, but I think there are a lot of people in Australia who would be able to see this argument. I mean, um, people getting their first job, in general, uh, in my experience in Australia, many of those people were working under the table because 
their bosses couldn't afford to pay them um, the award rate. It was just impossible. So it was either an under-the-table job or no job at all. And that was very common. Uh, so I think people wonder why that might be. Um, and they have experienced themselves of that. And certainly um, that's something where you see a lot of foreign workers in Australia working casually. Um, and it's on a, a casual basis and not award rates because that's what the employer can afford. And I can give you a specific example of that. I flatted for a while in Newcastle with um, an Irish guy and he was driving 100 kilometres or so to Wyong, which one is, is one of the highest unemployment uh, communities in Australia. And um, he was basically picking up the bins for them and working as a rubbish man. And I asked him about you know, the basis of this employment because I, I didn't think that he had a work visa, and indeed he didn't. And yet he was working for the council and he said it's cheaper and, and less risk for them to um, hire me to do it um, and I'll just work for an agreed amount. And so there's an Australian missing out on that job. And um, one of the reasons why is the award rate. So every unemployed person in Australia should be scandalised by uh, those rates and how they're arrived at and the fact that uh, the government is setting those rates too high um, such that employers, including local government, are willing to take risks and employ foreign workers uh, to do jobs that Australians are missing out on. Yeah, I mean, uh, to, to us it's, it's logical what uh, higher wages lead to, which is higher unemployment, but even though there's these cases of people uh, being paid cash in hand or under the counter or whatever you want to call it, there's, there's still this mindset that these laws are still well-meaning and there, there is still this fear that uh, if wages are reduced there'll be this uh, new generation of working poor uh, at, as it's put. So it's, like I said, it's it's such an incredible perception to try and break down, which is sort of like, because uh, I've been, yeah, I've been a free market advocate for, for quite a while now, and it doesn't seem, especially on industrial relations, like where we're getting anywhere. I mean, even though, uh, though, though we've got a high unemployment rate in Australia, there's, there's still not this logical connection that maybe our wage rates are too high and that they need, uh, that that uh, the government shouldn't shouldn't have them so high. Yes, um, it's it really is not doing anyone any good. And then you've got um, people are wondering why Gina Reinhart wants to import a lot of foreign workers for her mind. Um, I mean, it's fairly obvious to me why anyone would want to do that. And um, unfortunately, you know, the working poor argument. Well, you've got a choice between being working for the for a while, um, which might allow you some social mobility because you've got a work history, or being non-working poor, which is really uh, condemning you to a life of government dependency which you can never get out of. So I think that those stark choices need to be spelled out to people uh, in, in those terms. Yeah, uh, de uh, definitely. And it definitely requires a, a government that, uh, that is willing to step up and sell the message. I mean, the whole reaction of Turnbull and his ministers this week has been oh, that it was a decision by the independent umpire, which, which is just a cop-out. I mean, uh, saying that he, he, uh, Turnbull hasn't basically said, oh, I support reducing penalty rates. He's just said, oh, it's a decision by the independent umpire, which the Labour Party set up. We should just abide by it. Like, there's no... Like he's he's not making the case for why why this decision was made, and and, and it's allowing the the Labor Party to get their message out there really easily, saying you know this this is hitting working people, and so it, so it's basically uh, Bill Shorten in question time gets up you know it ta takes a swipe at Turnbull, and Turnbull just says oh it wasn't my decision like don't blame me I mean it's terrible. It is pretty terrible. I mean all of the 
the dodging um, is it's quite pathetic to watch. Yeah. And, and now they're looking like uh, it was revealed uh, today that they might be looking at some sort of compromise, which is they're going to grandfather penalty rates, which means if you're an existing worker, you still get the, uh, the old penalty rates and it's only newly hired workers who get the reduced penalty rates, which it was pointed out to me uh, by, by a libertarian today that that'll just mean that people who are already employed will no longer get Sunday shifts because they'll be too expensive. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, um, it, it's quite frightening for those people who are accepting those higher rates, and I'm sure they don't have a choice not to accept it. Um, but some of them will realise that um, this could be the end of their job, or at least the end of their working for penalty rates at all. Yeah, they, uh, and it's also the the fact that uh, another thing I would like to raise is that we're, we're living in basically a 24-hour economy now where people expect the, the shops to be open uh, Saturdays and Sundays, uh, trading late, uh, uh, but they, uh, they, they still uh, are, support, are supportive of, of penalty rates, which means that a lot of, especially small businesses, can't afford to open on those days. So if you want to be able to you know, go for uh, uh, a lunch uh, on a Sunday at the local cafe, uh, you've, you've got to... You've, you've got to be able to recognise that the fact that uh, penalty rates mean that you can't have that luxury. Yes, and um, that means a lot of economic activity that doesn't happen. Certainly, there are a lot more shops open in New Zealand on a Sunday in any given size of town um, than there are in any comparable place in Australia. So that's something that I notice when I travel. Yeah, it's it's different in in every state. I mean, Western Australia, the shops are still closed on on Sundays, but that's a, a government in a forced closure, not because of uh, penalty rates. But it, yes, it's if you go to to uh, many places in Australia that s sort of don't have like major major fast food places or supermarkets and it, and it, everything's owned by the local person everything's the, the local sh uh, local town main street is is dead on a sunday yes um and you know that's one out of seven days a week that people can't uh earn money i mean it's it's a scandal really and also, it's it's so uh, as I mentioned before, it's so hypocritical of the unions and the Labor Party to talk about the importance of penalty rates when they're negotiating away them in enterprise bargaining agreements. I mean, that is the real scandal. Yeah, I mean that that hypocrisy doesn't surprise us, but I think it might um, surprise some of the ordinary people out there who um, are, you know, otherwise quite persuaded by these unions uh, and who might be affected by that type of decision. Oh, I, I just get so outraged that they're allowed to get away with it. And this is the mainstream media again, that the unions have have reduced penalty rates themselves, yet the, the media doesn't, doesn't report on that. I mean, they're completely allowed to get away with it and be completely two-faced with the Australian people. I mean, that is just so frustrating. Yeah. Well, I agree, except that, um, you know, there are now people who are countering this, and you're one of them, and if you look at the success of Donald Trump, um, he hasn't done it without slaughtering some holy cows um, to get some attention. It's not just for attention, but um, he's really putting it out there that things have to change. And I think that politicians who are afraid of giving that message are missing out on a huge opportunity to reach people and to shake them up with a little bit of reality. And I don't think that people are against that. I think they're quite sick of being lied to. But um, the assumption that truth tellers will be um, completely banished from society and ostracised, I don't think that applies anymore. 
Yeah, it, it definitely requires much stronger political leadership to take on the trade union movement than we currently have. I mean, in New Zealand uh, in the early 90s, uh, you had a prime minister who was successful in, in taking on the, the trade union movement. Wow, well, lucky us. Yeah. And also, of course, there was the uh, uh, f famous case of Margaret Thatcher taking on the, the unions in the, in the 1980s uh, with the coal miners strike, which uh, Britain in the 70s uh, uh, faced. Uh, the streets were full of rubbish because it wasn't being collected. There was the three-day working week. I mean, it was a, a socialist hellhole, yet Margaret Thatcher had the political uh, leadership to, to take on the, the unions and help modernise Britain. And in do doing so, to be incredibly politically successful. I mean, there's there's no one like Thatcher. Um, I mean, there hasn't been anyone like Thatcher until Trump. Uh, Reagan was a bit like that, but then he got dementia halfway through, uh, and he, he was never quite as good after that, surprisingly enough. So I think that um, really, if you look back at the history of people who have explained clearly what their message is and why it works, people may not like to hear the fact that it costs too much money to get coal up to the surface in Britain because the coal is deep, um, but they can understand that if it costs more to get coal from the bottom of the mine to the pit head than it does to buy it from overseas, then it's obviously not a viable business. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, the closest we've had in Australia was uh, Victorian Premier Jeff Kennett in the early 90s. He took on the, the, the trade unions and the, the public sector unions and also uh, uh, phase one of the Howard government's industrial relations reform uh, with the minister Peter Reith was successful, but they just fell at the, the second time around with work choices and everything's just gone backwards since then. Yeah, well... Um... It's, it's a tragedy, all right, but I think that uh, the, the decision was probably a good one, although they could have come up with something better and said, why are we even being asked to decide this? This is not our business. This is between the employer and the employee. Um, however, you know, uh, a 25% cut, I think, will be a good thing for businesses. Yeah, definitely. Well, we'll move on to the second topic for this week, which is leadership speculation. Oh, that <laughs> we haven't had that in a, in Australian politics for oh, what maybe six months or so. Well, it it came back to the forefront this week because there was a news poll on Monday, which was the Coalition Forty Five, Labor Fifty Five, which is that is pretty bad for a news poll. That is landslide territory. Frightening stuff. Uh, it's it's kicked off. Uh, uh, leadership speculation because, well, late last week before the news poll, Tony Abbott appeared at a, at a book launch for a book, uh, Making Australia Right, who uh, we interviewed the editor of that book, James Allen, a few weeks back. So uh, uh, that was the Sydney launch and they were lucky to get Tony Abbott to launch it. And he put, he put through his plan to win the next election, which among other things was uh, a cut in uh, immigration uh, and also uh, reducing the renewable energy target. Uh, so, so really wanting to put uh, conser conservative conservative policies back at back at the center of the uh, of the government. Uh, so, and there was also revealed on Monday that Abbott, uh, Erica Betts, and a few other conservative uh, MPs were part of a secret messaging group. Their their plan was not to have Malcolm Turnbull removed as Prime Minister, but to get Tony Abbott back into Cabinet because he's currently uh, on the back bench. And they didn't use a message disappearing service such as Wicca, so it all got revealed by the newspaper, which was uh, pretty silly. Um, yeah, but the, the leadership rumblings have started again. I mean, uh, ever since Ke uh, uh, Julie Gillard replaced Kevin Rudd uh, in uh, 2010, we've just been in an endless uh, uh, leadership speculation and change cycle in Australia. Yes, and I wonder whether anyone's ever going to think that maybe that's because um, the type of leadership that Australia needs and wants is not the type of leadership it's been given so far. And uh, Tony Abbott is part of the problem, of course, because 
although he's um, said some good conservative things since he was booted out of being Prime Minister, um, he didn't say that stuff when he was Prime Minister. So who's going to trust him? Um, I mean, of course, he may well be better than Malcolm Turnbull on a number of levels, uh, and I think that's becoming quite apparent. But it's time for a real change in Australian politics. It's time for the people who are truly disenfranchised and who have very little option to express their political feelings um, to be represented. And I think that the only thing that I can see from an outside perspective that does that is um, either One Nation or possibly um, Corey Bernardi's new party. Yeah, I, I I agree with you that I certainly uh, don't, uh, don't believe that in Tony Abbott's uh, political uh, epiphany that he's, you know, found the error of his ways and if he came back he'd be an excellent Conservative Prime Minister. I, I've said previously that he's a career politician. I mean, he's only saying these things now because he wants to become Prime Minister again. Why didn't he behave as a Conservative when he was Prime Minister? Why didn't he dismantle the climate change apparatus when he was Prime Minister? Why did he back down on 18C. Uh, why did he not talk about immigration when he was Prime Minister? I mean, it's one thing to advocate for these things from the backbench, but it's another thing to uh, actually do them when you when you have got the power to do so. So no, I don't think that... Uh, I wouldn't want to see uh, Tony Abbott come back and his, his, his Liberal colleagues have basically said that what he's done is completely unhelpful and destructive. Uh, even uh, one of his closest supporters back in the 2015 spill, Matthias Coleman, uh, really laid into him. So, as, yeah, he's, he's got the, the hardcore conservatives in the party, the people like Erica Betts and uh, Andrew Hasty, uh, you know, on his side, but, you know, they're, they're not going to win him back the, the leadership. And although I do agree that, yeah, Turnbull, I mean, there's no going back. He, he's He's, fa he's failed as Prime Minister. I mean, what, do, what does he really stand for? What's his vision for the nation? There's, there's, there's hardly anything. And uh, as we talked about, his, his, his non-views on penalty rates this week was just a per perfect example. But the question is, who would replace him? And yeah, although One Nation uh, and Australian Conservatives with Cory Bernardi uh, are good alternatives, uh, it's still, I, I still believe that for the time being, the Prime Minister is going to come from a uh, Liberal Party. Party. I would prefer to go to somebody who has proven themselves as a uh, conservative, such as Peter Dutton, who's been excellent in immigration, uh, unafraid to you know, ba basically take the tough line and stare down the, the bleeding heart lefties. Yeah, well, look, I, the one thing I will say about Tony Abbott um, being a man to watch is that clearly he's a bellwether. So the fact that he is spouting conservative positions now that it's time um, for him to try and elbow his way back to the prime ministership that's a beautiful thing because he he knows that that's what um, is a point of difference in australian politics and he knows that that's what people are after from him perhaps he doesn't realize that we don't trust him um but he seems to realise that that is where the money is. Yeah, like I said, he's being a political opportunist. He's he's wanting to get back as prime minister, and he's seeing this as his ticket. And uh, I, it's really disappointing to see a lot of conservatives, you know, still. Uh, see him as the conservative messiah and are willing to forgive like what he did as prime minister. And it's yeah, I, I just think that. That's completely ridiculous, and you, you're you're making yourselves look like sheep there, in just you know thinking that you know he's going to be uh, he's going to come back, and it's all going to be great. Yeah, no, that's not going to happen. It's going to be a lot more painful than that. Um, but I think that you know, regardless of that, all of the right things um, can happen in Australia. I think that um, a a landslide for Labour at the next election would be such a disaster. Uh, I, I or... don't even like... Uh, it's it's like a bad dream if that happens. That would is, that is just be a nightmare, a Labour landslide. Yeah, I think they would alienate themselves extremely quickly. I mean, even Trudeau um, in Canada 
um, the the rate of Canadians trusting the government has fallen from 53% to 43% over the course of the year. There's an unprecedented swing away from people trusting um, the government of Canada, and that is basically a a Labour equivalent um, government that they have. So I, I believe that um, people who have decided that they would like to have a Labour government um, are rebelling and, and straining against that. Um, and I, I very much believe that that would be the same case in New Zealand if Labour were to win, which is a extremely remote possibility. But um, if they did, it wouldn't be long before all of the politically correct, um, totally unrelatable uh, SJW nonsense rose to the top and um, made it really untenable for them to continue. Uh, as a, yeah, a right-wing person in Australia, uh, I, lo I look upon New Zealand and their stable uh, conservative government with a high degree of envy, but I'm often told by New Zealanders that if Labor got back into power, it could all be ruined. Uh, well, I mean, I, th I think Labor ruined itself in 2008, um, a long time ago now, and I really don't think that there's any prospect of Labor getting back into power. Um, I think that immigration is becoming a huge issue here, and I think that um, the obviously the Labour Party, all they can do is cry out for more refugees, um, cry out for more immigration, and not uh, they just don't have anything to offer. So, really, from my point of view, I'm not worried about um, a Labour victory, but it sounds like you guys better get quite worried about that and I but I do really wonder whether news poll um, actually looked at a two-party preferred vote or did they actually look at all of the parties and, it's based and on the, the, the key thing is that it's based on the preference froze from the last election which mean, right. which means that there was a high one nation vote at the last uh, federal election but a lot of those preferences went to labor and actually knocked off a few uh, uh, liberal MPs, such as Wyatt Roy, he lost because One Nation preferences went to went to Labor. So there is this sort of in One Nation's vote this split of where the preferences go. So that could be influencing the two party preferred. But that's that's optimistic thinking that it's not as bad as as it could be. Yes. Well, um, Godspeed. I I really hope that. Um, the news poll doesn't get translated into an election result. But um, on the other hand, uh, when you look at Malcolm Turnbull, how much better than Julia Gillard is he? Uh, I, I really don't see much of a difference. Yeah, I mean, Turnbull, he's... Or the, the only benefit to having Turnbull as Prime Minister at the moment is that at least there's Conservatives in the party room. I mean, there, there's people there to basically, you know, keep, keep him in check. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, he was silly not getting um, not getting Tony Abbott back into the cabinet. It's obviously he is a person um, who could challenge the leadership again. You want to keep your friends close and your enemies even closer. Uh, and I think that you know this movement to get him back into cabinet, of course, it could easily turn into a movement to bring him back into a uh, a leadership position. So the, that could be easily shut down by allowing him to cabinet and um, making sure that he doesn't get too much power but is used to his full potential. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we'll move on to our final topic uh, for this show, which is uh, Trump's address to Congress. Now, at the beginning, I talked about uh, he continued his war with the the media at the end of last week. We talked about Trump versus the media on the last episode, so we won't uh, talk too much about that. But of course, the uh, you know hysteria from the mainstream media that oh, he's attacking the the First Amendment by not inviting uh, CNN, the Guardian, and BuzzFeed to. Uh, uh, his uh, uh, to his uh, press secretary's uh, off-camera briefing. Uh, it's, he, he's not threatening the free press. Uh, you know, he's entitled to not talk to a media outlet if he doesn't want to. 
That's exactly right. And of course, um, you know, did you see Obama being interviewed by the Daily Stormer? I mean, come on. Would that be viewed as not um, allowing the free press? Absolutely not. Obama knows that the Daily Stormer is um, thinks vile think, things about him and he doesn't talk to them. Um, you're not obliged to let in everyone who says that they've got press credentials. Of course, the other thing is that it's not just about who Trump likes or dislikes, it's also about who's relevant in the media landscape of today. And I think that uh, alternative media outlets are a lot more relevant now than CNN and MSNBC. So um, they, that's the battle that they're facing, is that it's not just um, the their freedom to practice what they want and to say what they want, um, but they, they can't enforce... Um, other people giving them interviews or allowing them into the press briefings. And, of course, there's also the issue that um, why would you waste too much time on CNN or the Washington Post, for instance, when their readership is tiny? And, you know, PewDiePie was recently... Um, called a Nazi by the Washington Post. And what's going on there is that um, the Washington Post is searching for relevance by commenting on the biggest YouTube channel in the world, which is a much bigger platform than they have. And PewDiePie actually said, you know, journalists from the Washington Post came to his house and offered him a platform to be able to respond. He can speak directly to 55 million subscribers. Um, the Washington Post has... 2 million subscribers if it's lucky. Um, so they are, by attacking him, it's a very cynical move to try and keep some relevance whatsoever. People Googling PewDiePie are now going to find Washington Post articles. So um, their traffic will go up. So th that's the way I see it. Um, and I'm sure that Trump is very aware that these businesses are only there to serve their billionaire owners and that um, as far as everyday people are concerned they're completely irrelevant and it's also the fact that you know why why sh why you know the washington post and cnn why should the fact that you know you've been around for 20 or in some cases over 100 years and you've got a billionaire owner why should you you be granted uh, greater access to the president than uh, any other media outlet i mean if you're worried about your access being cut from uh, the president then you should be campaigning for every media outlet no matter what type to be able to access the president well, it's not new that if you want to be in, in on the White House press briefings or any politician's press briefings, you have to behave yourself. This has always been the case. And to pretend that there's something new um, on the part of the president is really disingenuous. What's new is that whereas before newspapers and other media outlets existed to um, provide content to um, to people who would buy their newspapers or watch their shows, now they exist to do the bidding of Carlos Slim or Jeff Bezos or whatever equivalent. And so instead of being there to make money by um, selling newspapers and selling advertising in those newspapers, they're really just there to please, um, you know, as a, as a large blog, really, for... Um, vested interests and so that's where the change in behavior and focus has come in and i said uh in my article that i wrote about trump versus the media that uh as long as he doesn't you know uh, pass legislation to shut down CNN or throw Jake Tapper or Don Lemon in jail, then if he does that, then I'll speak out against him. But if he's just, you know, criticising the media for bad journalism, that's just part of, of the fr freedom of the press and free, ma free markets. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that people, people see the difference because they actually see um, the... They know where the suppression of free speech is coming from. And it's not from Donald Trump. And um, you know, it's it's not Donald Trump who made up the term fake news. They thought that that was clever and they thought that that couldn't ever be turned against them. Well, you know, it wasn't 
it was about three weeks before the Washington Post um, started screaming about how, uh, it, you know, it was a term that needed to be retired. And then, you know, someone said that calling CNN fake news was like calling a black person the N-word. And it's like, well, you know, you said it. Yeah, Don Lemon got triggered when uh, uh, one uh, a Trump supporter who was a contributor said that uh, our story was fake news and he shut down the segment. And it's sort of, it's it's interesting, these words that we, that the left created, uh, fake news and also uh, being triggered, they now want banned. Like they're saying, oh, you know, don't use the term fake news anymore. Stop using the word triggered. That's like, well, you, you created these words. Uh, they're, they're just upset that we, we on the right have appropriated them and begun to use them against them. Yes. I mean, maybe they should have thought about what this really meant. Um, and, you know, the fact that fake news um, is, is a term that has a meaning that people are able to think of for themselves. And if they start identifying it with CNN, maybe that means that there's a problem with CNN. I mean, just spitballing here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, CNN, it's, they're, they're basically, their, their tantrum is basically a cry for relevance because they're, they're losing people to the alternative media and so the only, the only thing they can think of to get people to tune into them. But, you know, Trump is trying to silence us. Right. Yes, well, um, maybe people just don't have the taste for anti-Trump hysteria that the media assumes that they do. I mean, I certainly don't. And even, you know, people people that I know who really have, in, in general, they've bought the message that Trump is um, bad and wrong. Um, and so that message has got across loud and clear but they're not interested in reading about it or, um, you know, they're not posting, very few of them are posting stuff online from CNN and expecting others to take it seriously. I love this meme that's going around, which is uh, a, a segment or a news, uh, news segment on CNN where, where the uh, anchor says, and we'll be back with more news after we've made some up. Yeah, well... Um, you know, it's it's very clear that that's what's happening. And I think, you know, I look back now to um, the news of, of my childhood and when I was, I was growing up and I, I look at it and think, um, you know, why why am I so sure that, um, that those media outlets back in the day um, were really in competition with each other and weren't cooperating in the way that is so obvious now? Um, and I, I haven't made up my mind or done any real analysis about that, but it makes you wonder um, how long we've been being lied to because actually when you see people who are um, not lying to you, you can you can kind of tell. Um, so it, you, you get better at working out um, who's talking rubbish. Um, and also, you know, in New Zealand, we do have, uh, we've got Radio New Zealand, it's very much a mainstream media outlet. Um, you know, they're still talking today. They were still talking about Russian hacking of the US election. And it's like, um, top of the news hour, nobody really believes that. Um, you, you know, who well, cares what Radio New Zealand thinks? Yeah. Oh, well, and now they're trying to get, this just broke today, Jeff Sessions. Uh, apparently he had, uh, the Attorney General, uh, two meetings with uh, Russian officials before the election, which he didn't disclose. And so they're trying to uh, create this huge scandal and are hoping that he's the next person to be forced to resign from the, the Trump administration. Yes, and um, I would strongly suggest to Jeff Sessions that he not resign, and I would strongly suggest to Trump that um, regardless of how many meetings Jeff Sessions had with Russians, because who really cares, um, it, not to fire him, because if it doesn't, if it stops working, then they'll stop that line of attack. Okay, they'll go to another one. But look, I mean, I wrote an article about the unfortunately named Pissgate where the mainstream media actually, uh, well, you know, was it BuzzFeed or, I can't 
can't remember. Yeah, but, BuzzFeed, you know, and um, then CNN gave it World War coverage. That's right, CNN, um, about Donald Trump um, hiring Russian prostitutes to commit acts of Eurolagnia all over a bed um, in a Russian hotel, and, it, and it's all on camera, apparently. And then you think, well, if that's all on camera when Trump was in there, allegedly, then um, was it all on camera when Obama was in there? And is that a bit of a problem, perhaps, that the room was bugged? Um, and then you look at the source, and it's clearly made up. I mean, it, and then they put this on air and talked about it as if it might or could be real, when anyone who knows anything about the internet was able to go back and look at 4chan and see um, where people have been posting about making this rubbish up. Yeah, exactly. Well, Trump, he had a, a good uh, end to, or well, we do this show in the middle of the week, so uh, the week ends when we do this show. So he had, a good, uh, I'll say, a good past few days uh, with his uh, address to a joint sitting of Congress where he reiterated his um, presidential agenda, so uh, promising uh, t uh, strong immigration control. It's interesting he actually said that Australia was the, the model to follow. Like, I don't, I don't think we're that good. We're still getting plenty of bad people here. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, you, you can see it. Um, we can see it from here. When there's family festivals in Melbourne getting attacked by gangs of, um, shall we say, foreign youth, obviously foreign youth, um, that that is not winning hearts and minds. And, um, you know, this idea that Australia has... Uh, very good border controls is really, um, you know, it, it needs to be reviewed. Of course, it's better than the USA because you have no land borders, um, but still, it's quite frightening. And in fact, I was uh, I was in Singapore recently, and I was with some people who are in the security industry, and uh, one of them pointed out an article to me about America's worst gang, and apparently there's a big fear that America's worst gang is going to set up branches in Australia and it's just going to be dreadful. And I, I just said to this person, how is this possible? How could an American gang set up in Australia with your fantastic border controls? It's not possible. These people are gang members. They can't come in uh, into your country because they'll all have criminal records. So this is a nonsense. And of course, you know, the answer to that was, oh, well, don't be so sure that the border controls are, um, are so tight. And of course, that is exactly right. And if anything, um, Australia's borders need to be further tightened. Well, at least uh, Australia has the benefit of have, uh, being surrounded by uh, oceans, while the US, of course, anyone can just come across their southern border. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, that advantage of having the oceans around you is only an advantage if you make use of it. And also during his speech, Trump uh, promised uh, company tax relief, which will uh, definitely be needed. Uh, he also talked about a restoring American pride, which is despite what uh, some people say, and especially some libertarians, you know, pride in you know, your culture and your heritage is actually, actually a good thing for morale. Yes, of course it is. I mean, um, would those same so-called libertarians go and tell um, Mexican Americans that pride in being a Mexican American was somehow um, bad or racist. I mean, come on. The one thing that uh, is concerning me is is Trump's uh, promised increase in military spending, which is sort of he he wants to be a non-interventionist, but then there's this ma he wants this massive build up in defence spending. Well, what for? Well. Uh, that echoes my thoughts exactly. You know, it's really good. Finally, Trump has um, done something that I truly believe is not the right thing to do. Uh, it's quite refreshing 
Um, he has his reasons, no doubt, but I would have thought that if you're spending uh, more than the rest of the world combined on defence and still getting quite um, poor outcomes, the, the thing to do is not to give them more money, but to require them to do more with less, which is eminently possible when they're given, I don't know how much it is, but it's isn't it half a trillion dollars a year or something? I mean, for that, you should be getting a very good national defence service. From what I recall, he wants to increase defence spending by $54 billion a year, which is, I mean, in Australian uh, bu budget terms, that's a huge increase. Well, it's 10% of the budget. Mm. So, I mean, that is a huge increase. Um, I'm sure that President Trump knows a lot of things that we don't, um, but it is, that is truly frightening. Now, I also happen to know that the US Army um, and other armed forces are, you know, working with some pretty outdated equipment. Um, they've, they've got some strong headwinds, but a lot of that is their own creation. And I really wonder, um, you know, it seems a little bit unusual to me that he's saying let's de spending overall, we'll increase spending on the military budget. Um, so that that's something that I don't quite follow. Yeah, there is uh, um, a lot of foreign policy uh, commentators have expressed concern that um, people in his administration will be pushing for a conflict with Iran, which would be another disaster in the Middle East we don't need. And he's also continuing Obama's war in Yemen, which for those who don't know, the US is backing the the, the Saudi-backed uh, pe people in Yemen against the Iranian-backed people. And it's really, Yemen is being destroyed. It's really, uh, uh, ba basically what's going on there is basically war crimes. I mean, people are starving there. It's it's horrible. Yet Trump is, is not changing anything. Yes. Um, well, I, I guess he's doing what he can. Um, but it's frightening if that's not something that he can pull the plug on. It just shows that how difficult it is to take on the neoconservatives. I mean, uh, even even Trump is, you know, he's he's too scared to, you know, take on Saudi Arabia and, uh, you know, not uh, not so, uh, take such a hard line with Iran. Yes, um, yes. I mean, Iran is. It's a problem in many ways, mainly for its own people. Um, and it is very belligerent on the world stage. However, um, they it's not like they go around attacking other countries. Um, so why bother antagonising them? Uh, on the other hand, they, they do make some fairly uh, bold statements about the US and its allies. However, in my personal view, um, that could probably be dealt with on the basis of making uh, bold statements in return rather than preparing a military build-up. I suppose the other thing is that they're very deep into actual conflict between their proxy uh, forces in Yemen, for example. Uh, and. You know, I'm not quite sure how Syria fits into that jigsaw puzzle, but I am sure that it does fit in somewhere. Yeah, it's it's certainly something to keep an eye eye on. And even though Trump has has done a pretty good, uh, I'd say, an excellent job so far, there's still these areas of concern. So for people who say that I just cheer on Trump no matter what he does, I mean, I've offered some criticism here of of what he's doing. So you know, I'm not a I, I, I'm not a zombie. No, well, hardly. I mean, yes, I don't think anyone could really. Um, accuse you of that with a straight face. Uh, I, but, I, I, you know, I covered on uh, Facebook from from libertarians who say that you know, oh, tr you know, you're just a cheerleader for Trump, and oh, you know, Trump, you know, did did this thing that was wrong. Oh, wh wh uh, what do you think of him now? Like, just th think that I'm just some mindless person who cheers on Trump no matter what. 
Yes. Well, I have to say that although I love them dearly, um, libertarians are not politically effective. So, should we just leave it at that? Yeah. Uh, that's probably a good note to end the show on. So thank you, Arthur, for coming back on and being my co-host for today. No worries. It is my pleasure. Can I add um, one little thing? Because you just um, you, you praise New Zealand and a lot of it's deserved, but um, I just wanted to point out today um, there was an, an article in a vile rag that I won't name, uh, but it is New Zealand's biggest newspaper, and it was talking about how the University of Auckland cannot ban a European Students Association. They'd like to because they're worried that um, the material that they've produced is similar to that that um, might be produced by a white supremacist group. Uh, how they would know what white supremacist um, material looks like, like, I'm not quite sure. But, um, you know, you can look at this two ways and you can say, you know, it's vile that they are just picking on these people because they're expressing pride in a white identity and that it just goes to show that, um, you know, this is not allowed in our society. Or you could look at it as absolutely bloody fantastic that there is a European Students Association at the University of Auckland um, and they've just got all of this wonderful free publicity and I'm sure that their membership of 10, which um, frightens the university um, so much that they say that they would like to ban it, um, I'm sure that that will grow tenfold over the coming days. Um, and I'm sure that it will produce a great group of people who celebrate European culture and heritage, which is the, the purpose of the group. Um, and... Another thing that I was quite pleased about is that the University of Auckland said, we can't ban it. We don't have that authority. Um, we can dislike it as much as we like, but we can't ban it. So, um, yeah, if anyone wants to join the Auckland University European Students Association, uh, that would be most um, welcome, I'm sure. And um, if you're... Asian or dark-skinned or not European uh, by race, I'm sure um, that they would like any help and support from anyone whatsoever as long as you're keen on European heritage and culture. And really, who isn't? Yeah. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how the club uh, goes. Maybe it's uh, maybe in a future article you can talk about how it's all unfolding. What a great idea. Thanks very much, Tim. Uh, so a special announcement before uh, we wrap up the show is that we have officially announced, oh, officially confirmed our uh, West, uh, live stream for the Western Australian state election, which is being held on March 11th. We will be broadcasting this live stream uh, on Facebook and YouTube Live. There will be myself, Sukit Fernando and Damien Ferry providing an alternative take on the Western Australian election result. We will be focusing on the performance of the minor parties and also the makeup of the, the new upper house. We're hoping also to have a few people from uh, the various minor parties to get their take on the results. But we certainly hope to offer a unique and uh, interesting insight into the results. It'll be starting at uh, 8 p.m. Uh, on March the 11th because Western Australia is still three hours behind so the polls close later. Uh, but it's our first live stream event so we're all very excited, excited about it. So uh, please, uh, I've provided a link to the event in the description. So uh, please, please confirm your attendance and it will provide definitely uh, better coverage than maybe you'd get from the ABC or Sky News. Uh, of course the usual reminders are that, uh, that um, please sign up to our email list if you haven't done so already, the unshackled.net slash subscribe. Also, don't forget you can support the work of the website. You can become a patron on Patreon, donate via PayPal, or sign up to advertise with us. And don't forget to subscribe to the show on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, Tuning Radio, or view the video version on YouTube, which there isn't one for this episode. And also don't forget to keep checking out the unshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. And thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.